Hello, big beautiful world. Today we're taking up the Junkers Ju52, the Panther U, the Arty Ju, the Iron Annie, call it what you will. We're taking up a seaplane version. Let's just hop out and have a quick squeeze before we get her up in the air. That's if we can get her up in the air, peeps, because there's a lot to start up. Actually, I don't know if there is. We'll find out. We'll find out. Seems to be a lot going on, though. All right, here we are in the Deutsche Wings livery. It's pretty cool. It looks like some kind of carefully wrapped Christmas present. I like it. We're on the Hawkesbury River. I'm going to go on and pretend that that geographic Bing break line there, that Google Maps break line. We're going to pretend that that's actually, uh, I don't know, one of the many oyster farms up the Hawkesbury Way. So we might have to fly over that in order to get up in the air. So. Rest assured, ladies and gentlemen, no oysters were harmed in the making of this video. Alright, so this is the tri-motor version. Drei Motoren, wie sie sagen in Deutsch, I believe. And we are going to try and take off before I talk crap for half the hour. Okay, so let me have a squiz because there's a lot, like I said, going down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm talking about here. Okay, so we've got mag set to, hang on. Yeah, mag set to both. Come on, kid. Other way, we want them in the middle. Want them in the middle. Get that down. No, that's it. So in the middle, I believe they come up to break the contacts. Uh, yeah, in the middle, in the middle. Spät, so, so later. I think that's a retardation for the mags, magnetos. That's gonna give us contact. Did we go down? Okay, so that opens them up. Yeah, opens it up, opens it up. Mm-hmm. Believe that's our battery. Yep. So we see quality of life taking on. Let's get ourselves some lights before people get too upset with us. Come back to that landing light. Ah, position lights, yeah, nav lights, we're good. Strobies, collision lights, it has no effect. Passenger lights, no. Oh, look, let's just chuck those puppies on. We've got amperage, we're good. There's our... I think that's our fuel, looking good, our fuel. Okay, so, 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 oh, yes, yes, yes. Nebulizer's cool, but we're going to need, I think, sound, one of our many compressors. Oh, yeah, um, else. We're gonna have to have some fuel pump at some point. We're gonna have to have some, some juice in it. Some, uh, some, some juice. Uh, all right, unlock that. I believe that's our wobble. We want that fully down. Now, I could be wrong. Let's see if we can reinstate our... Oh, hang on. We'll, um... That's our landing lights, which is odd. I'm just coming across a bit. Oh, yeah. You know what? We're going to run with that. Okay. I believe that's all there is. Let's reinstate the yoke, because taking off without the yoke is just weird. How cool is the wood grain? All right, so come down. All right, here's the big test, I guess, gang. Does it love us? We've got to start. We've got to start. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a start. All right, I guess we want to get the other two started now. That's it. Two good engines, two good starts. You loving it? Yep. Very quiet, these beamers. Uh, BMW radials on this puppy. All right, and because we've got no brakes, we are just going to take off. I don't want to give it any flaps if I can help it. The Hawkesbury's nice and calm today, but um, 
we're just going to get her up in the air try and keep her on the step as we get her out of here oh a bit of a rough one yeah that's enough Sorry, I didn't, wasn't watching what I was doing. Ordinarily, I'd be a little more considerate. But that was good. That was taken off. That wasn't even full throttle to get her up into the air, gang. Which, of course, is bad practice. But, you know, that's okay. So we're taken off out of the Hawkesbury. We're going to run down to the Hawkesbury. Hopefully, just get her over to Rose Bay in half an hour. And that will be your flying liar guided tour for the day. We'll pass over... Hopefully Pete Island, Scotland Island, uh, and the old railway bridge, a few other things, come over Hornsby, um, northern suburbs of Sydney, or northwest suburbs of Sydney. I'd originally wanted to fly her out of, sorry about the wobbliness, I was just scratching my noggin. I'd originally wanted to fly her out of, uh, What did I want to re oh, originally out of uh, Gosford or Woi Woi just for a tourist trip and uh, yet another of my interminable stumble stumbles down memory lane but the Hawkesbury is as good as any sorry gang just playing around with head settings all right cool so the Junkers the Junkers the Junkers Hugo Junkers what a guy what a guy uh, this puppy, he was building his famous J1 aircraft during World War One. It was a close support aircraft made of basically corrugated duralumin, duralumin, or duralumin. You know, basically corroded, corrugated, uh, corrugated um, aluminium, and. Because of, you know, th this in an age where other aircraft were still basically wood wire and fabric, you know, doped canvas. His aircraft was kind of revolutionary. It's substantially weightier, of course, but it uh, had the power, you know, a power ratio to match. Off the top of my head, I think, I think it was a BMW inverted 8 or inverted 12 back then. But, uh... Either way, it was a much loved aircraft. How cool is this? North of Sydney, this is what the Hawkesbury River looks like. It is pretty darned impressive, peeps. Yeah, so that was a J1 and I think the J2. A lot of that was confiscated after, obviously, with the Treaty of Versailles after World War One, And then throughout the 20s, and here's one of the great myths that's kind of sort of perpetuated with Luftwaffe is that, you know, they only came into existence with Hitler. The fact is they never went away. Even under the Weimar Republic, the Luftwaffe was probably one of the most thriving areas of engineering for Germany post-World War I, uh, the German economy prior to the crash. But um, they actually built a great deal of aircraft, so Junkers and Claudonia and a whole bunch of them were uh, very much in business throughout that period. And they had bases over in Russia, they worked hand in glove with the Russians uh, to develop and test their aircraft so that they wouldn't fall foul of the Allied demands imposed upon them by the Treaty of Versailles. And this was one of those aircraft. So this was actually designed in, I think, late 1930, thereabouts. And it flew not long after that in the single motor version. I believe the single motor version carried over from the older, uh, I want to say, F-13, I don't think it was W, it might have been the W-13-14 that had the inverted 12 inline engine in it. 
Again, I think it was a Beamer Donka BMW engine. Um, but uh, where are we heading, folks? Let's let's get out this way. Do I even have a whiskey on this puppy? So yeah, and before long they had the single motor and then split out to, as you can see, the three donks, the three motors, drei motoren. And such was its popularity, I think by the end of the run, that is to say, by the end of the Second World War, Junkers alone have produced around 5,000, maybe just shy of 5,000 of these beasties. Uh, in all forms, it, militarily speaking, it saw action in Angola with the Portuguese. It also saw, uh, sorry guys, just readjusting the head, headset again. Um, yeah, the war in Angola, independence war with Portugal pride well, no, no, well after the outbreak of the, uh, well after the end of the Second World War. In fact, it continued into the 70s. It was a thing when I was a kid. We often got footage on our TV of what was happening over there. Um, we also, yeah, Spanish Civil War, it saw action. So this kind of point of irony that for all the great pilots is a, a great deal of uh, attention brought to the fact that during the Battle of Britain many of them were experienced pilots from the Spanish Civil War, which is true. But ironically, most of their best pilots were transport pilots. They weren't actually combat pilots. Well, they were combat pilots, but they were actually, uh, they flew puppies like this rather than the famous ME-109 and so on and so forth. Ah, so cool. So darn cool. Just want to keep her straight and level. In fact, I want to hop out again for a tick because it looks pretty amazing. Sorry about the volume plan. Pretty darned impressive. It's funny, in the morning light it looks golden. Very cool, very incredible. So we're bringing it around. Head over this way. Uh, yeah, the aircraft obviously among the most famous shots are during the invasion of Crete, the marginally successful and hard won Battle of Crete. Okay, we're going to come up over via Palmy, Palm Beach, make our way down and head off into the harbour as we come off all the northern beaches. So looking out, up north there we see Woi Woi and Gosford and when I was a kid they would be places you would go for a holiday but thanks to the marvel of modern technology and freeway and marginally less corrupt governments around the world we get the benefit of having that as Gosford and essentially Woi Woi uh, well arguably suburbs of Sydney now that's the level of expansion Sydney has taken on but uh, this is what we call Millionaires Row or one of the many Millionaires Rows areas along here from Palm Beach down along the northern beaches and we'll be coming over those shortly gang and down to our south there, that's, uh, that's sunny sitters. Bit of cloud, I'm actually getting up a bit. We've probably come down a bit. So this thing is uh, so weird, it's got two altimeters. One only kicks in, I think over the 10 grand mark, over the 10, 10 angels 10, the uh, 10,000 mark. Whereas the other, 
is good up to that mark. Right, we'll get it below the cloud line. It's a good day for it, ladies and gentlemen, up here in flying. So, Yunkers, back to Yunkers. Back to Yunkers. <sighs> Dry motor. Well, what can I say? Yeah, so, okay, the marginal uh, success of Crete, which history tends to remember as this bold, very much like the Blitzkrieg, phenomenally successful battle during the Second World War, when in fact it almost ran at a loss. The, the cost of the Germans was so high that Hitler vowed never again to employ paratroops in the paratrooper role. And ironically, uh, <laughs> strangely enough, Churchill, Eisenhower and many others were so shocked by the victory in Greece that it was then that they trained up um, it's then that they dedicated themselves to training paratroopers full time. The Russians, of course, had had them pre-war. Japanese had had them pre-war. But uh, yeah, it, it's a point of irony that it was the heartache and the loss of Crete which precipitated the Allies focusing on airborne invasion, which of course was instrument, instrumental throughout Normandy. Red Devils, the 101, the Screaming Eagles, etc. Uh, training up outside Manchester and over in the States. But uh, back to the Tante U and Hugo Junkers. Hugo Junkers have really cool aircraft. There was, I always say they always have really cool aircraft, and I don't really restrict that to any one country or any one designer there were many and there are many consistently around the world looking to, to make uh, you know flying a, a whole lot healthier just going to get her on an even trim beautiful people as we bring her in over palmy So we'll come in, uh, we, won't, we won't take it directly over Baron Joey Headland there. We will head over, out over Palmy here though. Hopefully not lose too much speed. Yeah, 200, that's good. Running about 75%. All right, cool. Junkers perhaps one of the strangest designs to actually take to the air throughout the war was his uh, 287 the forward swept wing which I've referenced in other videos but yeah they don't have one of those for flight sim yet maybe one day Monday, maybe one day we'll get a a cool run of oddities from that period whether it be the Lee Richards annular aircraft prior to the outbreak of World War One, right through to many of the 1950s oddities that crept in. But yeah, the 287 with the forward swept wing and the various engine configurations, which the Russians did take, because the Russians got the Junkers Dessau testing site and manufacturing plant after the war. Uh, and they took many of the Junkers engineers back. I believe Hugo Junkers was amongst them. Uh, took them back to Russia. So a lot of the Russian developments post World War II actually come from Junkers I think her tank from Focke-Wulf he was a bit of a he was an ardent Nazi and I'm not sure if he fled straight away to Argentina where he designed the Pulki but that's that's a that's a different story altogether Junkers uh, like many German developers was hard at work uh, at, towards the end of the war on jet and rocket designs. The famous Messerschmitt 163 Comet, the only rocket powered fighter to see service in World War II, which ended up being more of a terror to its own, you know, causing more harm to their own pilots. Because the um, the the dual, the combination of the fuels, the volatility of the fuels, if the engine if, if the tanks were empty of the fuel i don't know what the hell that line is planned that should not be there 
not at my beloved Baron Joey headland. I've got lots of fond memories hanging out on this beach and up on that headland. Uh, that's actually just a look, we'll pretend it's not there, right? Down here, uh, Akuna Bay. So down where I'm looking now towards the R11, that's, uh, that's Palm Beach right there. Got a bit of shipping as one would expect in a harbour city. It's very popular, very, very popular river and estuarine system for Hawkesbury for uh, recreational boating. So normally you see a whole lot more boats dotted about right about here. Uh, yeah, so back to the ME163 and you're thinking where the hell are you going with all of this bollocks flying line? I'm getting to it, I'm getting to it, where, bear with me. So the 163, they were looking to improve it because it was so deadly. So Junkers was contacted because Vili Messerschmitt had fallen into disrepute with Goering and the other top ranking Nazis for a number of reasons. He often, he was just a very controversial contrarian type figure but uh, they ended up handing off the con uh, Reichsluftministerium ended up handing off the contract to Junkers to improve on the 163 and I believe the Messerschmitt crew had already done all the hard yards it was just down to Junkers and the team to build the thing and it became the uh, JU 263 I think from memory it was a larger aircraft They never really determined whether it was more stable. I think they got maybe a couple of flights out of it in glider form, and that was pretty much the run of it. However, after the war, I think McCoy and Gurevich, MIG, ended up taking that design and building the forerunner to the MIG-15. They'd already tried it, you know, strapping a, a jet underneath the uh, MIG-3, I think it was. But uh, again, this time around they had a, a whole vastly different airframe to work around. And so I believe it was a forerunner to the uh, MiG-15. Maybe the MiG-9, was that the Farmer? But yeah, so Junkers was instrumental with helping uh, the Russian aero industry post Second World War. As to how instrumental he really was, it's always up for debate because, you know, the Russians do tend to play things, or they certainly did understand and play put things close to their chest. I learned an interesting thing a few years ago. I had a friend, a mate, who was researching um, the Holodomor, the, the Ukrainian uh, genocide. And I hope I said that right. But uh, he had access, he was one of the first guys over in Russia back, from Australia anyway, uh, back in the late 90s I think it was. He had, he could go through the Moscow archives and he pointed out something I never really knew or a, a, a kind of misleading aspect of, um, of Russian, I'll call it bureaucratic culture. And that is that uh, we always think of the Germans as having meticulous paperwork, you know, being meticulous bureaucrats and, and document keepers and so on and so forth. And as he pointed out, no, the Russians were actually far better. It's just that they played things closer to their chest. And believe me, that's not a sledge on the Russians. I've got many... Oh, yeah, I've got... Yeah, I do have quite a few mates from everywhere from... Oh, mate... Uh, all over the Russia and all over areas of the Ukraine as well but obviously Moscow right up through uh, uh, Murmansk uh, a guy I used to work with from Vladivostok so yeah I you know people are people at the end of the day people are people but uh, they are meticulous document keepers so they he had access to a lot of and I wish I'd known him at that time because I loved 
just loved aeronautics and, aer and, and you know engineering facts about so many areas. But a lot of this stuff really only came to light, light obviously after the fall of the wall in '89, and even then only slowly. We're still learning so much about it. All right, Clan, we're coming over Sydney, so we're going to lose a bit of altitude. Bring her in between the heads. We can see straight ahead of us, ahead of us that promontory out there is North Head, and of course that's South Head, but uh, further on till it's our one o'clock there. And we're going to bring her in over Rose Bay there. Hopefully, I won't, I won't hit anything on the way down. The reason I wanted to bring her in over Rose Bay is because up until the, I want to say mid late 50s, they used to take Seafords and Sunderlands out of there for Qantas and other, I think ANSAT as well, the airliners. We had a, a, a pretty vibrant seaplane culture. And I think it was Rose Bay where they all came in. And Rose Bay you can actually see just off at hour 11 o'clock as well, down there in the south, where uh, the top of the fuel gauge is pointing to. And that's where we'll be coming down. As we bring her down along here, past Collaroy and Queenscliff and all the northern beaches. Uh, Pearl and... Oh, there's a string of them. Palmy down. Doubtless there's a few I've forgotten. Been a long time between drinks since I've gotten up that way. Sydney skyline, of course, cropping up there. Uh, I won't take you around. Maybe we'll do that some other day. Past the coat hanger. Maybe do the obligatory fly under the coat hanger. Fly under the harbour bridge. Uh, whiz around the um, MLC tower. Try and do a quick run down George Street or Pitt Street. But yeah, so straight ahead of us there is Manly. This is, I don't know what it's called. It's Man Manly Beach proper. And I'm not sure what the inner beach is called. Is that inner Manly Beach? All I know is my brother would take me to the cinema just on the inner side there as a kid. Also as a kid, I'll, I'll, as we fly over it, I'll try and get some uh, optics on it. Just want to point something. For any of you who have watched the other videos, you'll know I'm often banging on about sharks and stuff. And I think it's because they terrify me and fascinate me simultaneously. And when you grow up in a, a city like Sydney or a country like Australia, yeah, you're out there in the water and you do, you know, it crosses your mind but you don't let it get you down because I think it was Valerie Taylor who said they'll always see more of us than we see of them, which is basically testimony to how how benign they are, they're just big fish. And if they had hands, they'd sort of grope us first rather than bite, which is a kind of strange image, the idea of being groped by a shark, but perhaps that's a conversation altogether for another day, beautiful human beings. Okay, so we're just fly, uh, flying in over Manly here. Uh, Northern End, Queenscliff, by the look of it there, are just coming up under our left side of our donk. They look a little ice creamy, I don't want to get too close to it. Fear it looks like something out of a horror movie. But uh, I just want to see if there's one building model. And that way I can do the whole, you know, taxi driver tourist thing for you all. So if ever you're down this way, you might want to contemplate it. Okay, so. They haven't really modelled where... Yeah, okay, so there is a, there's a building here. See those two large-ish buildings on the waterfront there? They haven't really modelled where the... Uh, that's where the, ferry com um, the ferries come in. And here on the southern, uh, on the western tip, just under, coming up under our window there by the A pillar, those two areas there, that one with a little L shaped, reverse L shaped thing coming off it, that's actually the Sydney Aquarium. And if ever you're up this way, you can dive with the grey nose sharks and the rays and that there. It's, uh, you, you know, you can pay to go in there and swim with the sharks and so on and so forth. So, great diving all around here. 40 baskets over yonder, right throughout the harbour, Clifton Gardens. So you're, if you're into da diving, it's one of the best kept secrets in the world is Sydney is a magnificent dive harbour. Uh, you wouldn't think so because of the traffic, not that you can see any of that today, save for a few lazy tankers out there. 
must be Sunday. All right, we're going to put it down. What's our speed looking like? Might have to drag her up a bit. And we're in Ks, so we're in kilometers. So we've got to be guarded about how slow I can bring this puppy in. I want to try and reduce the speed a bit more. Trim her up a bit. Yeah, all right, cool. We've got some flaps. We'll give ourselves a second stage of flaps here and bring her down. God, I forgot my own city. I don't know if we're heading into Elizabeth Bay or um, Rose Bay. I'm going to I'm going to say this is Rose Bay, where they used to bring the Sunderlands in. And of course, as usual, I'm doing one of my famous uh, high that flap noise. Actually, the engine noise in this aircraft is full on. It's a great beast to fly, though, and it was a real. Real adventure learning just to start this thing. We've got Middlehead over here. There's Taronga Park Zoo down yonder. Mossman, another affluent suburb. There's the Sydney skyline as you can see it, ladies and gentlemen. But they still do joy runs, uh, joy flights out of here, out of out of the harbour. I think, uh, I don't know what aircraft they are. They, they, I don't know. I don't think they'd be beavers. I don't think they're de Havilland's. They might be de Havilland's. Why not? I mean, they're... Good an aircraft as any, they're rugged, still in use throughout the world. Uh, speaking of still in use throughout the world, there are still a number of these puppies flying as well. And they are um, only a handful of them, but I think there's actually quite a lot of them still extant as static displays, the Yonkers. They're rugged, and to think that, you know, the. the uh, yeah. Let's just keep her off until we get past there. Don't want to run in 20 shoals down here at. I think that's Shark Island. There we go. And we're down, ladies nice and gentlemen. Nice landing. Thank you very much, my friend. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to get over here. And we are going to bring her down. Hello, city of Sydney. So, actually, nice short flight. Didn't really get to talk about much. No brakes, this thing I don't even think has rudders proper, so we're just going to come off, kill out the mixture, which is something you wouldn't ordinarily do, but uh, actually, you know, we should get it closer to land and somebody can get out there on a speedboat and retrieve us, I think. That's actually Shark Island. I think it's Shark Island or Clark Island. But anyway. Famous seafood restaurant over here, Doyle's, that won't be modelled. I say famous a lot, they're not, they're not really famous at all, are they? I mean, anybody who's watching this bloody video, you'll be thinking, man, I barely know, know where Sydney is. What makes you think I'm going to know a restaurant in Sydney? Anyway, that's my bad. Forgive me, I just make assumptions about people. And about many things, beautiful human beings, about many things indeed. Sometimes, just sometimes, those assumptions are right. Not often, though. All right, gang. I'm just going to cut her out, and that's it. That's our run up in the Yonkers. One, two, three. We're good, and we're safe in the harbour. We can't chuck an anchor out. We can do that in the... Uh, the Grumman Goose, and that's pretty cool. Alright, so, let's get her all shut down, shall we? Come on, the nebulizer. Oh. Don't worry about that. Yeah. A bit hoo, hoo. Yep, cool. Hoo. Down, down, down. Out. Off. Alright, and off out off oh, for the landing lights so strange having landing lights position there uh, lock up the wiggle lights come off 
All right, light them up if you've got them, and no, you don't, don't. Smoking's a crappy habit. And now we just wait for the water taxi to come, take us for a run into the harbour, hop outside one last time. It is cool. It is very cool. I don't care how inaccurate or accurate the flight model is. I don't care about its failings or any of that stuff. It looks golden. In, ah, that's gorgeous. Look, look at that puppy. All right, beautiful people and big, beautiful world. We'll sign off on that note. Thanks for joining in the madness. Bye.